Well, hello everybody. Um, Mr. S here for another uh, Monday Night Live reading with my uh, long Popeye pipe uh, or whatever it is. Actually, I think of it more as like Spencer Tracy sitting in a skiff uh, demonstrating to the spoiled uh, rich kid who's fallen in the water, uh, you know, how not to be a jerk in his life. And I don't smoke, so, but I can breathe through the pipe and uh, add some ambiance. It also helps to have a uh, ship's wheel here. Um, this is this is nice and adds to our reading. Anyway, um, I thought I needed to do something because I don't actually have the book cover for this book, The Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. And uh, tonight I'm going to be reading from this after I have a make a couple of comments on it, as I usually do. Um, the Old Man and the Sea, written by you know Ernest Hemingway, and uh, he actually wrote it in Cuba in 1951. It was published the following year in uh, 19. Actually, yeah, in 1953, the year after it came out, it won the Pulitzer Prize for Literature. And then the next year, Ernest Hemingway was uh, awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature, uh, in part for this book. This book contributed, according to the committee, contributed to why they awarded him the Nobel Prize in Literature. Um, so, so um, yeah, I'm going to be reading from this tonight and uh, wearing the closest thing I have to a, to a ship's hat. Um, hats just don't, I don't look, good in hats but I like this one so uh, and it adds something I think to the reading it'll maybe it'll make me sound a little bit more I don't know Cuban or something as I as I read uh, maybe that will add some ambiance if not I'll pull the pipe up every once in a while and take a puff on it um, so anyway uh, yeah we're gonna be reading from Ernest Hemingway's The Old Man in the Sea tonight and why do I like this book um, I'm actually not a huge fan of of a lot of Hemingway's stuff um, I like some of it his short stories were really um, he was really masterful at some things. And this book, I think, demonstrates his mastery of prose. Like, he got to this point. This, to me, this is the high water mark for Hemingway. And I really like this as a story, in part for its simplicity and its power. It's really simple, raw human characters without trying to do anything over the top. It's just, like, conveying someone's life, but it's a, but, or a, or a short period in someone's life, just a simple person but uh, like the moment of triumph when you'd think they would be beyond a moment of triumph. And there's something very human about that. Um, he, he's, it, it's also kind of encouraging to me to read because I've read a bunch of early Hemingway um, when I was pr doing the byline thing, the byline curriculum that we have. Um, I went back and I read some of, byline, of Hemingway's work from when he worked as a cub reporter at the Toronto Sun. And also he worked as a reporter here in Kansas City where I live for the Kansas City Star. And some of his stuff was just not very good. And in part, that's probably understandable. Whenever you're working, you know, on the clock, having to go dig up a story, um, you know, and having to write something, produce it, throw it out there. Of course, it's not all going to be good. Um, everything I've written has not <laughs> been very good. Most of it isn't. Um, but but um, that you can see a progression in him is fascinating to me. And what he learned from journalism uh, that carried over into novel writing. The other thing that I find really cool about this book, and the reason that I use it when I teach novel writing, is that it's a great demonstration of the power of simplicity, but also the power of great storytelling principles. So in the One Year Adventure Novel program, I talk about five different um, elements of story. They are someone to care about, something to want, something to dread, something to suffer, and something to learn. You need all five of those for the story to work, right? Well, in The Old Man in the Sea, Ernest Hemingway gives you the first three, someone to care about, something to want, and something to dread, um, all in the first page. And you could argue that he does it in the first sentence, which is kind of amazing, really. Um, the opening lines of the story, um, it's actually not very long, not very big. This is a really short no uh, novel. You could say it's a, almost a novella. Um, here's the opening page. And, and how much um, he develops in that tiny, you know, like a little over one paragraph is just remarkable. He implies the other two elements, something to suffer and something to learn. The something to suffer is really kind of the price paid. So what we want, we're going we're gonna to hear about it in the first sentence, what this person wants. And we're going to find out what price he's willing to pay for it. And that is going to establish the value of the story goal of the something to want. At the same time, he's going to develop a, a, a kind of lesson, a theme, without it being, there's nothing preachy in it at all. It's just someone who, who does something noble 
um, something very simple, very, very human, very in a way, very elegant. And uh, I'm not going to spoil that for you because I'd much rather you read the book and experience it for yourself. Um, but some, in other words, something to suffer and something to learn are actually hinted at in the first in the first page too, and in this section that I'm going to read. So this is about 140 pages long. I'm going to read like 20 pages of it, something like that. It doesn't take too long to read, um, and then we'll go on to something else. So, so this is Ernest Hemingway's The Old Man and the Sea. He was an old man who fished alone in a skiff in the Gulf Stream, and he had gone 84 days now without taking a fish. In the first 40 days, a boy had been with him. But after 40 days without a fish, the boy's parents had told him that the old man was now definitely and finally Saleo which is the worst form of unlucky. And the boy had gone at their orders in another boat, which caught three good fish the first week. It made the boy sad to see the old man come in each day with his skiff empty, and he always went down to help him carry either the coiled lines or the gaff and harpoon and the sail that was furled around the mast. The sail was patched with flour sacks, and furled it looked like the flag of permanent defeat. The old man was thin and gaunt with deep wrinkles in the back of his neck, the brown blotches of the benevolent skin cancer the sun brings from its reflection on the tropic sea were on his cheeks. The blotches ran well down the sides of his face, and his hands had the deep creased scars from handling heavy fish on the cords. But none of these scars were fresh. They were as old as erosions in a fishless desert. Everything about him was old except his eyes, and they were the same color as the sea and were cheerful and undefeated. Santiago, the boy said to him as they climbed the bank from where the skiff was hauled up. I could go with you again. We've made some money. The old man had taught the boy to fish, and the boy loved him. No, the old man said. You're with a lucky boat. Stay with them. But remember how you went eighty-seven days without fish, and then we caught big ones every day for three weeks. I remember, the old man said. I know you did not leave me because you doubted. It was Papa made me leave. I am a boy, and I must obey him. I know, the old man said. It is quite normal. He hasn't much faith. No, the old man said. But we have, haven't we? Yes, the boy said. Can I offer you a beer on the terrace and then we'll take the stuff home? Why not, the old man said. Between fishermen. They sat on the terrace and many of the fishermen made fun of the old man and he was not angry. Others of the older fishermen looked at him and were sad. But they did not show it, and they spoke politely about the current and the depths they had drif drifted their lines at and the steady good weather and of what they had seen. The successful fishermen of that day were already in and had butchered their marlin out and carried them laid full length across two planks, with two men staggering at the end of each plank, to the fish house where they waited for the ice truck to carry them to the market in Havana. Those who had caught sharks had taken them to the shark factory on the other side of the cove, where they were hoisted, on a, black, on a block and tackle, their livers removed, their fins cut off, and their hides skinned out, and their flesh cut into strips for salting. When the wind was in the east, a smell came across the harbor from the shark factory, but today there was only the faint edge of the odor, because the wind had backed into the north and then dropped off, and it was pleasant and sunny on the terrace. Santiago, the boy said. Yes, the old man said. He was holding his glass and thinking of many years ago. Can I go out and get sardines for you tomorrow? No, go and play baseball. I can still row, and Virgilio will throw the net. I would like to go. If I cannot fish with you, I would like to serve in some way. You bought me a beer, the old man said. You are already a man. How old was I when you first took me in a boat? Five, and you nearly were killed when I brought the fish in too green, and he nearly tore the boat to pieces. Can you remember? I can remember the tail slapping and banging and the thwart breaking and the noise of the clubbing. I can remember you throwing me into the bow where the wet coiled lines were and feeling the whole boat shiver and the noise of you clubbing him like chopping a tree down and the sweet blood smell all over me. Can you really remember that or did I just tell it to you? I remember everything from when we first went together. The old man looked at him with his sunburned, confident, loving eyes. If you were my boy, I'd take you out and gamble, he said. You're your father's and your mother's, and you're in a lucky boat. May I get the sardines? I know where I can get four baits, too. I have mine left from today. I put them in salt in the box. Let me get four fresh ones. 
One, the old man said. His hope and his confidence had never gone, but now they were freshening as when the breeze rises. Two, the boy said. Two, the old man agreed. You didn't steal them. I would, the boy said, but I bought these. Thank you, the old man said. He was too simple to wonder when he had attained humility, but he knew he had attained it, and he knew it was not disgraceful, and it carried no loss of true pride. Tomorrow is going to be a good day with this current, he said. Where are you going? the boy asked. Far out, to come in when the wind shifts. I want to be out before it is light. I'll try to get him to work far out, the boy said. Then if you hook something truly big, we can come to your aid. He does not like to work too far out. No, the boy said but I will see something that he cannot see, such as a bird working, and get him to come out after dolphin. Are his eyes that bad? He's almost blind. It is strange, the old man said. He never went turtling. That is what kills the eyes. But you went turtling for years off the mosquito coast, and your eyes are good. I am a strange old man. But you're strong enough now for a truly big fish? I think so, and there are many tricks. Let us take the stuff home, the boy said, so I can get the cast net and go after the sardines. They picked up the gear from the boat. The old man carried mast, the mast on his shoulder, and the boy carried the wooden box with the coiled, hard-braided brown lines, the gaff and the harpoon with its shaft. The box with the baits was under the stern of the skiff along with a club that was used to subdue the big fish when they were brought alongside. No one would steal from the old man, but it was better to take the sail and the heavy lines home, as the dew was bad for them, and, though he was quite sure no local people would steal from him, the old man thought that a gaff and a harpoon were needless temptations to leave in a boat. They walked up the road together to the old man's shack and went in through the open door. The old man leaned the mast with its wrapped sail against the wall, and the boy put the box and the other gear beside it. The mast was nearly as long as the one room of the shack. The shack was made of the tough bud shields of the royal palm, which are called guano, and in it there was a bed, a table, one chair, and a place on the dirt floor to cook with charcoal. On the brown walls of the flattened, overlapping leaves of the sturdy, fibered guano there was a picture in color, in color of the sacred heart of Jesus and another of the Virgin of Cobra. These were relics of his wife. Once there had been a tinted photograph of his wife on the wall, but he had taken it down because it made him too lonely to see it and it was on the shelf in the corner under his clean shirt. "'What do you have to eat?' the boy asked. "'A pot of yellow rice with fish. Do you want some?' "'No, I will eat at home. Do you want me to make the fire?' "'No, I will make it later on. Or I may eat the rice cold. "'May I take the cast net?' "'Of course.' There was no cast net, and the boy remembered when they had sold it, but they went through this fiction every day. There was no pot of yellow rice and fish, and the boy knew this too. Eighty-five is a lucky number, the old man said. How would you like to see me bring one in that dressed out over a thousand pounds? I'll get the cast net and go for sardines. Will you sit in the sun in the doorway? Yes, I have yesterday's paper and I will need the baseball. I will read the baseball. The boy did not know whether yesterday's paper was a fiction too, but the old man brought it out from under the bed. Perico gave it to me at the bodega, he explained. I'll be back when I have the sardines. I'll keep yours and mine together on ice, and we can share them in the morning. When I come back, you can tell me about the baseball. The Yankees cannot lose. But I fear the Indians of Cleveland. Have faith in the Yankees, my son. Think of the great DiMaggio. I fear both the Tigers of Detroit and the Indians of Cleveland. Be careful, or you will fear even the Reds of Cincinnati and the White Sox of Chicago. You study it and tell me when I come back. You think we should buy a terminal of the lottery with an 85? Tomorrow is the 85th day. We can do that, the boy said. But what about the 87 of your great record? It could not happen twice. Do you think you can find an 85? I can order one. One sheet. That's two dollars and a half. Who can we borrow that from? That's easy. I can always borrow two dollars and a half. I think perhaps I can too. But I try not to borrow. First you borrow, then you beg. Keep warm, old man, the boy said. Remember, we are in September, the month when the great fish come, the old man said. Anyone can be a fisherman in May. I go now for the sardines, the boy said. When the boy came back, the old man was asleep in the chair, and the sun was down. The boy took the old army blanket off the bed and spread it over the back of the chair and over the old man's shoulders. They were strange shoulders, 
still powerful, although very old, and the neck was still tr strong, and the cre creases did not show so much when the old man was asleep and his head fallen forward. His shirt had been patched so many times that it was like the sail, and the patches were faded to many different shades by the sun. The old man's head was very old, though, and with his eyes closed there was no life in his face. The newspaper lay across his knees, and the weight of his arm held it there in the evening breeze. He was barefooted. The boy left him there, and when he came back, the old man was still asleep. "'Wake up, old man,' the boy said, and put his hand on one of the old man's knees. The old man opened his eyes, and for a moment he was coming back from a long way away. Then he smiled. "'What have you got?' he asked. "'Supper,' said the boy. "'We're going to have supper. I'm not very hungry.' "'Come on and eat. You can't fish and not eat.' "'I have,' the old man said, getting up and taking the newspaper and folding it. Then he started to fold the blanket. "'Keep the blanket around you,' the boy said. "'You'll not fish without eating while I'm alive.' "'Then live a long time and take care of yourself,' the old man said. "'What are we eating?' "'Black beans and rice, fried bananas, and some stew.' The boy had brought them in a two-decker metal container from the terrace. The two sets of knives and forks and spoons were in his pocket, with a paper napkin wrapped around each set. "'Who gave this to you?' "'Martin, the owner.' "'I must thank him.' "'I thanked him already,' the boy said. "'You don't need to thank him.' "'I'll give him the belly meat of a big fish,' the old man said. "'Has he done this for us more than once?' "'I think so. "'I must give him something more than the belly meat, then. "'He is very thoughtful for us. "'He sent two beers.' I like the beer in cans best. I know, but this is in bottles. Hot here beer, and I take back the bottles. That's very kind of you, the old man said. Should we eat? I've been asking you to, the boy told him gently. I've not wished to open the container until you were ready. I'm ready now, the old man said. I only needed time to wash. Where did you wash, the boy thought. The village water supply was two streets down the road. I must have water here for him, the boy thought and soap and a good towel. Why am I so thoughtless? I must get him another shirt and a jacket for the winter and some sort of shoes and another blanket. Your stew is excellent, the old man said. Tell me about the baseball, the boy asked him. In the American League it is the Yankees, as I said, the man said happily. They lost today, the boy told him. That means nothing. The great DiMaggio is himself again. They have other men on the team. Naturally, but he makes the difference. In the other league, between Brooklyn and Philadelphia, I must take Brooklyn. But I think of Dick Sisler and those great drives in the old park. There is nothing ever like them. He hits the longest ball I've ever seen. Do you remember when he used to come to the terrace? I wanted to take him fishing, but I was too timid to ask him. Then I asked you to ask him, and you were too timid. I know. It was a great mistake. He might have gone with us. Then we would have that for all of our lives. I would like to take the great DiMaggio fishing, the old man said. They say his father was a fisherman. Maybe he was as poor as we are and would understand. The great Sisler's father was never poor, and he, the father, was playing in the big leagues when he was my age. When I was your age, I was before the mast on a square-rigged ship that ran to Africa, and I have seen lions on the beaches in the evening. I know, you told me. Should we talk about Africa or about baseball? Baseball, I think, the boy said. Tell me about the great John J. McCraw. He said Jota for J. He used to come to the terrace sometimes, too, in the older days. But he was rough and harsh-spoken and difficult when he was drinking. His mind was on horses as well as baseball. At least, he carried lists of horses at times in his pocket and frequently spoke the names of horses on the telephone. He was a great manager, the boy said. My father thinks he was the greatest. "'Because he came here the most times,' the old man said. "'If Durachet had continued to come home each year, "'your father would think him the greatest manager.' "'Who is the greatest manager, really, Luke or Mike Gonzalez?' "'I think they are equal. "'And the best fisherman is you?' "'No, I know others better.' "'Que va,' the boy said. "'There are many good fishermen, and some great ones. "'But there is only you.' "'Thank you. You make me happy.' I hope no fish will come along so great that he will prove us wrong. There is no such fish, if you are still strong, as you say. I may not be as strong as I think, the old man said, but I know many tricks, and I have resolution. You ought to go to bed now, 
so that you will be fresh in the morning. I will take the things back to the terrace. Good night, then. I will wake you in the morning. You are my alarm clock, the boy said. Age is my alarm clock, the old man said. Why do old men wake so early? Is it to have one longer day? I don't know, the boy said. All I know is that young boys sleep late and hard. I can remember it, the old man said. I'll waken you in time. I do not like for him to waken me. It is as though I were inferior. I know. Sleep well, old man. The boy went out. They had eaten with no light on the table, and the old man took off his trousers and went to bed in the dark. He rolled his trousers up to make a pillow, putting the newspaper inside them. He rolled himself in the blanket and slept on the other old newspapers that covered the springs of the bed. He was asleep in a short time, and he dreamed of Africa when he was a boy, and the long golden beaches and the white beaches, so white they hurt your eyes, and the high capes and the great brown mountains. He lived along that coast now every night, and in his dreams he heard the surf roar and saw the native boats come riding through it. He smelled the tar and oakum of the deck as he slept, and he smelled the smell of Africa that the land breeze brought at morning. Usually when he smelled the land breeze, he woke up and dressed to go and wake the boy. But tonight the smell of the land breeze came very early, and he knew it was too early in his dream, and went on dreaming to see the white peaks of the islands rising from the sea, and then he dreamed of the different harbors and roadsteads of the Canary Islands. He no longer dreamed of storms, nor of women, nor of great occurrences, nor of great fish, nor fights, nor contests of strength, nor of his wife. He only dreamed of places now, and of the lions on the beach. They played like young cats in the dusk, and he loved them as he loved the boy. He never dreamed about the boy. He simply woke, looked out the open door at the moon, and unrolled his trousers and put them on. All right, well, that was the opening uh, 20 pages from The Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. Uh, real quick, I'm going to go through. We're doing another book bundle giveaway in June. Um, we have the winner of the May bundle, which I will announce in an email that should go out uh, could go out tonight if I get it done. Otherwise, it'll go out tomorrow. Uh, our our June book bundle is actually um, called Summer Adventure, and I have all the books here but one. It was going to take them too long to get the book here, so it will be in the bundle when we send it out, but it won't be in the picture. So the first book that's on our on our list is Terry Pratchett's Going Postal. This is a great book. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's hilarious. It's actually got a lot of profound stuff in it, and um, it's just full of Pratch Pratchettian, uh, <laughs> Pratchett-esque cleverness and witticisms, uh, but it's also got some things that are very thought-provoking. And so I'm going to do a reading of this, and uh, next Monday night I'm going to be reading from the old, from uh, Going Postal by Terry Pratchett. And if you win the book bundle, um, you will actually get a copy of it. Next one is um, Jane of Lantern Hill by L.M. Montgomery. This has uh, got a really cool cover. I've not read the book, so I can't say much about it. Um, an even cooler cover, in my opinion, is Where the Mountain Meets the Moon. This is a Newbery Honor book, and that cover I just think is fantastic. It's It actually wraps around the book. It's got a very heavy feel to it. Uh, it's got the original stamp on it, too. It's kind of cool. Uh, we've got three summer books that are actually of summer in the title. This one's by Ali Condi. It's called Summer Lost. The next one is called Summer of the Monkeys. And the other one is... Thimble Summer by Elizabeth Enright. And I haven't read any of those books. Those are all staff picks. Here's one I have read. I read when I was much younger. I've read it a couple of times. It's probably been 15 or 20 years since I've read this, but it's called The White Mountains. It's the first in a, in a series of books by uh, John Christopher. And it's got a cool cover, very H.G. Wellsian tripod um, cover on it. I actually heard this uh, on an old PBS show where there was a guy who would do readings of books, partial readings of books. I'd forgotten that until I was saying this. Um, but I heard the opening of this book, and I was like, I need to find out what happens in that book. So I checked it out of our library and thought it was terrific. Now here's a book that I really want to read now that I got it. It's an actually National Book Award finalist. And this is Rachel is on our staff. This is one of her favorite nonfiction books, and she's read a ton of nonfiction books. She says this is the book... I think I'm right in saying this is the book that made her love nonfiction, and it's like a, um, 
beautifully produ uh, produced book too. And it also is a uh, Newbery Honor book. And then we have a really great book that I did read a couple of times it's called The Time Traveler's Guide to Medieval England, a handbook for visitors to the 14th century by Ian Mortimer. And I'm going to be doing a reading from this book as well um, in three or four weeks. I'm doing another reading next Monday, and then I'll, I think we're taking off for a week because we have our summer workshop, and obviously I'll be there instead of, instead of reading. Um, and then the last one we have is Robin Hood, very classic version. Um, this is the, a hardcover, fully illustrated, beautifully illustrated, glossy uh, book. And we have one more that has not arrived yet. Like I said, it's King King Jack and the Dragon. And that one's just on back order or something. So um, hope you enjoyed The Old Man in the Sea tonight. Hope it inspired you to pick up the book and read it. We actually, like I said, we read about probably the first six of the book. It doesn't take long uh, to read it. And you will have read a Nobel Prize winner and a Pulitzer Prize winner all in one sitting, possibly. So have a good night, everybody. And I will see you next time.